Hey everybody, and welcome to this, my video on the Minolta Auto Cord. This is, oopsie, that's not supposed to be there. It's supposed to be there. Um, this is a fixed lens TLR, which is a distinction I make only because there are in fact interchangeable lens TLRs. This just is not one of them. This is a, this camera has a fixed, or, this camera has a selenium cell light meter. And if I can get it out of this case, I'll show you what any of this actually means. There we go. All right. Oh, how did people use these cases and change film and all that stuff? Uh, you'll have noticed that the focusing arm on the on this auto cord is broken off. That happens on very many of them. It's a it's a known weakness in this camera, and it broke off well. It broke off before I got this camera. It broke off in shipping when it was given to me. So, at any rate, these things happen. So, here's your TLR, selenium cell light meter. Now, my understanding is that the the light meter versions of the LMX were only available on the Japan market cameras and were not available on the foreign market cameras. I don't know if that's true, but that's what I saw in a couple sources online. So um, maybe it's true. This has shutter speeds of bulb and zero through nine, which by the way, here's the shutter speeds, Minolta. Uh, why? Okay, but at any rate, it's not really the end of the world because on top of the camera here, right here, you should be able to see it. There's also your shutter speeds in actual time. The zero through nine on the front, though inconvenient for easily setting up uh, a, a shutter time, do align with the light meter and we'll see how to use that in a bit. The viewfinder on this has one X magnification, meaning that what you see in the viewfinder is the size of what you're gonna see on the film. It's just not the actual image that will be on the film because it's being coming through the viewing lens. It has a fixed matte field with central circle, which you should be able to see. There we go. There you can see the circle. As I move this around a little bit. And you should also be able to see that there are four lines, two horizontal and two vertical. Those are framing guides, but they also show you where four by four is because people would use these to take four by four bright slides that you'd line up the center, take your image, and then the 120 film would be cut down to four by four and put into a slide that could then be put into a 35 millimeter projector, slide projector. So those, those lines serve double duty. They show you the, the four by four uh, area and help you align your vertical and horizontal lines in the scene. And then the flash sync on this camera, because it uses a leaf shutter, is any speed. So this was targeted at, in the words of Minolta's advertising, premium camera users. We know this is a high-end camera because it has a light meter, which many TLRs of the time did not have. It has exceptional build quality, except this bit right here that always breaks on these. It is a, has a wonderful focusing screen. It, it's very bright, very usable. The lens in this is a Tesser type lens and it is fantastic. It is very, very well engineered. It also has a crank style film advance on it, which is a hallmark of high-end cameras and a double exposure cam built in. Uh, I've read that you can use this for three and four exposures, but I haven't actually been able to make that happen mechanically. So insofar as I know, this only allows double exposures, not triple and quadruple and so forth. It has a sliding focus as opposed to a knob focus, which means that as you slide this lever here on the bottom, you focus the lens, and that is ergonomically more pleasing than a knob, which is a little bit harder to use. It ha functionally, it also has a circular aperture across the entire range. And let's see if I can show you what that looks like. And here we are at f3.5. We'll open that back up, Let's see if we can get a slightly better view of that. There we go. You can see that the aperture from a functional perspective is circular 
throughout the entire focusing range, which means you're gonna have very, very nice out of focus area uh, qualities in, the, in this camera, regardless of what you pick for your aperture. These were made by Chiyoda Kogaku Seiko KK in Osaka, Japan from 1955 to 1966 for the entire auto cord lineup. This specific model, the LMX, was made from 58 to 59. It was preceded by the AutoCord L. It was concurrent with the AutoCord without a light meter, LMX. The SR2 and the SR1 likely, I believe, I could have a little bit of trouble finding out exactly when those two 35 millimeter cameras were produced exactly. And it was followed by the next AutoCord to have a light meter, which was the CDS in 1965. So there was a six year gap between this one when it went out of production and when the next auto cord with a light meter entered production. So now if you have your auto cord, we'll take a look at some of the features and see what everything is and what it does. Here we are on the top. You can see the Chiyoko logo and the serial number. This is the viewfinder that pops up so you can uh, take a look at the focusing screen. Here we have the pop-up magnifying glass, and to use the pop-up magnifying glass, you just push that in. If you want to use the sports finder, you just push this front part down, then you look through the back, and this is a quick focusing guide. You look through here, line up your image, and just take your, your photo, just like that. To release the sports finder, you put your finger in here, let this pop up, and now you can close your magnifying gla glass and close the the viewfinder cover. The magnifying glass is used for fine focus. It is exceedingly useful. Um, when I shoot TLRs or similar cameras at, like the RB67 and so forth that have a magnifying glass on the viewfinder, I almost always use the magnifying glass. It, it's just very nice for getting precise focus. And because we're talking about with this camera, you'll see now on the front of it, Telephoto lenses that are 80 millimeters. Is that 75, 75 millimeters on this one? In 35 millimeter terms, that's a short telephoto. This has the same depth of field compression as a 35 millimeter, 75 millimeter lens. So even at f3.5, you're going to have a shallow depth of field, especially up close with these lenses. On the front of the camera, we have a lot. This is where the majority of the camera's magic happens. Here we have the meter cell, if your model has the meter cell, and then this cover flips down. Because this is selenium, anytime light is reaching it, it's on. And anytime it's on, it's depleting the selenium supply in the meter. So this helps give you longevity with your meter. So you don't want to just walk around with the cell open like this all day, because once these die, they die. There is no fixing them. There's likely no replacing them. So this will help you make your selenium light cell work as long as possible. Here we have the shutter speed control and the aperture control over here. And then on top of the lenses, we have something that displays your shutter speeds here on the front. You might be able to see that moving. And behind it, it displays your aperture. If you can't see that, then just check it out on your auto cord if you have one. Uh, it's a little bit easier to see in person. Over here, we have the flash sync. Uh, the flash sync selection. Uh, X is modern flashes, F are FP bulbs, and M are M bulbs. So if you're going to be using this camera, leave it on X, because any flash you can buy today is X. M and F flashes are in pretty much impractical. The bulbs, while still made, are expensive, and the flashes are a little bit more challenging to use. Plus, because it's, an, it's a leaf shutter, an X flash will sync at any shutter speed. Here you have your flash PC socket. This camera does not have a hot shoe, so your flash has to connect to that little port. Shutter button, shutter button lock and release right here, this little dial around it. Here around the lenses you have Bay 1 filters, so if you're going to be using filters, you, you, need, uh, you, you get Bay 1 filters or Bay 1 lens hoods. Lens hoods and colored filters, you only need one of to go in here, but if you're going to use macro filters, for instance, you would need two. One for each lens, or 
one here to focus, get your focus, recompose, and then put your Bay 1 filter here. You can do that too. At any rate, if you're doing that kind of stuff, you pretty much know how to do that with a TLR. Um, probably nothing surprising that I just said there. Uh, I thought there was a self-timer lever, but I'm not seeing it. So maybe there isn't. And then here is the focusing lever with the focusing scale down here. On the right side of the camera, we have the film advance crank. I always want to pull this thing upwards and you don't. To, to use the film advance crank, you just flip that up and there you go. Here we have the frame count window. This is the warning indicator. This is the frame count reset button right here. This uh, arrow right here indicates that you can advance the film that way or crank it this way to arm the shutter and take a double exposure. This is your depth of field calculator right here. And the way that this works is that you can adjust this. There's two little knobs on it. So let's say you're going to be using F16 and you want to get infinity to as close as possible in focus. There's a little infinity mark there and it's connecting to a line that goes to the 16. You find the 16 over here and the line that goes to it and on this camera, which is in feet, weirdly, because I wouldn't have thought that with a, if, if it's true that the export models did not have light meters, this should be in meters, not feet. At any rate, you find the 16 over here and look for where that lines up. It's just a little bit beyond 10 feet, maybe 11. So what this calculator tells you is that at F16, everything from 11 feet to 16 will be in focus, uh, to infinity rather, will be in focus. But let's say you're a little bit closer. Let's say your proper focus is actually four and a half feet, but you still need to use F16. Well, now we know everything from about 3.75 feet up to about five and a half, five and a quarter feet will be in focus. So basically, whatever your focus point is, you line up with that red indicator there, and then you find your aperture number, and then you look for your aperture number as it spreads away from that red point to figure out exactly what's going to be in focus. That's everything on this side. Well, and then a strap lug as well. On the left side, we have a strap lug, an accessory shoe, which you can plug a flash into, but this is not a hot shoe, even though it looks like it has a contact. I don't think it's a hot shoe. Yeah, my notes say this is a cold shoe, so that's probably just a spring to help it stay in. We have knobs here that help you with the film spools. This is the film back release, and this is the light meter calculator. And a little bit later in the video, I'll show you how to use the light meter calculator. We'll do that specifically as, as its own section because it is, it's an exposure, oops, it's an exposure value calculator. And that's a much different way of calculating light than what you've probably seen. So um, we'll go through how that works separately. On the back, we have zilch. On the bottom, we have the tripod socket and the hinge for the film back and then two feet so that you can set this thing on the ground or on a picnic table or whatever and take photos with it. To get inside of the camera, we pull this little knob out like that and the camera pops open and now we are inside the camera back. This is where you put the film that will, uh, the empty spool that you're going to load the new film onto. So we'll see here when we advance the film. Well, it didn't work that time. Well, I, I guess we'll find out if this camera works or not in just a minute. This is where you would put your empty spool for your take up spool. This little button right here lets the camera know that the film back is closed. These rollers help the film move through the camera smoothly. We have film guide rails here. These two on the inside work with the, pressure, the film pressure plate right here to keep the film sandwiched flat on plane. And these four on the outside keep the film from moving up and down. These two red dots are your start index marks, meaning when you load your film, the arrows imprinted on the paper get loaded to those red dots. And then this is where your new film is going to go when you load it so that you can take photos. And then this roller right here helps keep proper tension on that film as it's coming off of the spool so that it runs through the camera correctly. 
and these little doodads on the side are what you pull out to load your film. So you pull them out, you rotate them a little bit so they, they don't pop back in, and then you load your film. So while we are here, oh, and then one other thing here is a light baffle. This is a nice feature as it helps improve contrast in your images. So while we are here inside of the camera, let's load film and find out if this camera's advanced mechanism works and uh, take a look at everything in that regard. So we're going to pull that knob out, rotate it a little bit so that we can drop the new film into the camera so that we can drop the new film. Oh, I see what the problem is. <laughs> I have that backwards. This is where the empty spool goes. My notes have lied to me. So when you're done with your roll of film, you take it out of this area and you drop it into this one. There we go. And now that's ready to go. And as you can see, I'm going to advance the film here. And now it's turning like it's supposed to do. Okay. So next we're going to take our roll of new film. We're going to pull this knob out, rotate it a little bit. I'm going to drop this in. And we are going to, this guy, there we go. Click back into place. And now we pull out a bit of a leader. And we're going to advance it until those arrows line up with those red index dots. You don't have to pull it out the entire way all at once. I just did because, I don't know, who knows why. Going, now what we're going to do, there we go. A little bit further than intended, but that is not the end of the world. Next, make sure that's reset. Now we just start advancing until it tells us to stop, which it does at frame one. And that's how we've loaded the film. Um, warning indicator is orange, telling us we are ready to start taking photos. So what I'm gonna do is film is one and done. So you don't actually want to do this in real life. But I'm gonna open up the film back so you can see what's going on here inside of the camera. The number one, is a little bit off center. That number one should theoretically be right here, but because we allowed the film to go a little bit further than we should have at the very beginning, the, it's not gonna be lined up perfectly. In this case, with this film, that would probably cause this roll to cut off a little bit of the 12th frame doing that. Um, so that's why it's important to line up the arrows with the start button. Uh, I'm sorry, with the start indices. So after you take a photo, when you advance your film, it just rolls through the camera like that. Oops, I have been going on too far. Because it reset. It allowed me to do that because I reset. So when you advance the film, what it will do is it will advance until you get to the next frame, and then you dial it backwards, you rotate the crank backwards, and you are gonna be aligned properly. And you just repeat that. And each time you advance the film, you'll advance it a different amount because the thickness of this take-up spool increases as the film and paper are rolled onto it. And that's, that's how the film moves through the camera. Now I'm going to need to save this film for another video here. Next thing we're gonna do is talk about how to use the light meter. So here we are on the front of the camera and we adjust these, the aperture and the shutter speed but they're not the actual speeds, they're numbers. So this is a really clever and ingenious system. And, and um, my earlier vitriol at Minolta for it, it was short-sighted. Let's come over here and take a look at the side of the camera. All right, so if you look in the center of the screen here, there's a silver bar right up along the side of the body between the zebra and the camera here. There's a little red needle right about here where my finger is. Watch what happens to that red needle. You can see when I flip up the light meter and the studio light shines in, that red needle moves. Okay, so if we, we have here our ISO selection dial and there's an index 
as well as negative one and negative two stops, which are used for double exposures and exposure compensation. So let's say we have 100 ISO film in the camera right now. We set the 100 to that little index. Now we're gonna go back here. We're gonna take our light meter reading and we can see that that number is at 11. That the, uh, the red needle right there is lined up with that black zebra stripe, which aligns with the number 11. That's all well and good, but what do we actually do with that? What we do with that is come back to the front of the camera and find these numbers. Now what we need to do is select any two settings that add up to 11. 5 and 6, 7 and 4, 9 and 2, 4 and 7. This uses exposure value. Any combination of these numbers that add up to the number that aligned with your meter reading will give you a proper shutter speed so, and, and aperture combination. So if we select 6 for your aperture and 5 for your shutter speed, that gives us 1 50th at f8 which is correct, 400 ISO film with the amount of light coming off of the studio light into the light meter. Likewise, if we pick uh, aperture eight and shutter speed three, that gives us one-tenth of a second at f16, which is the same exposure value as the previous reading. Now, these numbers here for the shutter speed are in red. Those mean that your not going to be really able to hand hold the shutter, the camera at that shutter speed without camera shake. Over here, the number seven is in red, that's F11. And that's your, um, th that's in, in red because that's a very good aperture to use. It's got a good depth of field, it's nice and sharp, so it's good for zone focusing, so on and so forth. That's why that one's in red. So the genius of this system is that all you need to do to be able to get a proper light meter reading is read the number on this side and add up two numbers on this side to get a proper EV. And that's it. That's how you read the calculator and input your data to take, an ex to take a photo. Let's talk, so we've gone over everything with this camera that there really is to know. Let's talk about the process of taking a photo now. So basic process, what you've done is you've advanced the film until you get to the first frame. We're gonna rotate and lock the crank in place. You're going to take your light meter reading, going to read the light meter reading off of the calculator, making sure that your film ISO is set correctly. Then you're going to select your shutter speed and aperture based on this number, adding these two up. Focus, you'll be looking through the focusing screen here, but you find your proper focus. Oh, that looks good. Take your picture. That's it. That is the process of taking a picture. It is pretty streamlined, especially for a camera of this vintage and uh, pretty easy to do. Then you just advance to the next frame and you're set to take your next picture. Okay, so what about double exposures. For double exposures, they're really pretty easy because this camera's designed for it. The mechanics of it is you take your first picture, then instead of cranking forward, you crank backwards, which rearms the shutter so you can take a double exposure. It won't let you do it again. You have to crank forward the next time. So there are no triple and quadruple exposures on this camera. The science behind it is that if you take two, uh, if you take an, a proper exposure, you get the right amount of light reaching the film. If you do a double exposure with the right amount of light reaching the film twice, it will be a very thick, dense, or dark negative that will have, you'll have trouble digitizing or printing in the dark room. It'll have low contrast, digital artifacts, things like that. So for a double exposure, you need to cut the amount of light in half. And the way you do that is by finding, by controlling either of these. And basically what you wanna do, this is aperture, this is shutter speed. 
To cut the amount of light in half is you slide one of these numbers to the next highest. I tend to control with shutter speed if it's available. So if our meter reading was a 13, let's say, and you're at seven and six, all you have to do is go to eight and six or seven and seven. Then what you do is you take your, well, you have to advance first, of course. Take your first photo, rearm the shutter, take your second photo, advance to the next frame. And that's it, that's how you do a double exposure with this camera. It's really super simple, super easy, and the exposure value scales on this make it very easy to figure out which way you have to go when you're taking a double exposure. For flash use with this camera, any X-Sync flash will work. You plug it into the PC port right here. You can put it on the accessory shoe. You don't have to. You can also hand hold it or have it on a flash bar coming off to the side of the camera. And any shutter speed will work with the flash because this is a leaf shutter. The leaves are closed, they open the whole way, and then they close again to take an, ex an exposure. And the flash is triggered when the leaves are open the whole way. So the flash the light from the flash can reach the film at that time. Uh, and as, as a matter of technique, if you're going to use a flash, you can stick it out to the side here, which is, which is just fine because the flash will be way off to the side. Ideally, you'd want to have an articulating head so you can bounce it up and back down to get a uh, bounce flash lighting off of from your subject. But if you don't have that, you, um, having it off to the side is also pretty good. And there are some things that you don't want to do with your camera. <clears throat> and now some things you don't want to do with your camera. Do, uh, don't store it with the shutter ready to fire. So when you're done taking pictures, push the shutter button. Let the tension on the springs be released as that will preserve the life of your shutter. Basically, it's a clockwork shutter and there's all these springs and when you arm the shutter, they're under tension. And if they stay under tension like that, they'll start to develop a memory and their springiness will diminish and then your shutter timing will be screwed up. Don't touch the actual shutter, which means don't take apart the shutter. Don't leave your camera in your car because the heat can cause the lubricating oils to get thin and get onto the shutter, which will cause it to work improperly. And the same thing, if it gets really cold, the lubricating oils will get thick and break down and then start to work improperly as well. Also, uh, leaving a camera like this in your car is a really good way, even if you're just filling up your gas tank and then going in to pay for uh, you know, your 20 bucks in gas or whatever, uh, to come back to having a broken window and no camera. Don't store this in a plastic bag or box, as that is a really good way for fungus to grow on the lenses or in the leather. If you do, make sure that you have a rechargeable desiccant pack in there. Don't let your camera get wet. It's not weather sealed and the mechanisms in here can rust or be damaged by water and you don't want that. And just remember that your Minolta Auto Cord is a precision tool and should be handled with care and respect. And as long as you take care of your, your camera, your camera will take care of you. So that's it for my video on the Minolta Auto Cord. If this was helpful, please give me a thumbs up. That lets me know that I'm on the right track in making content which is useful and helpful to you. If you have comments or suggestions, please leave those below. I'm pretty good about checking every couple of days and responding. If you are an amateur photographer who has taken photos with the Minolta Auto Cord, please feel free to post a link to your work below. And one last thing, thank you everyone very much for watching and I will see you in the next camera video manual series.